Good evening everyone, my name is Devin Malanfi. I'm a senior midshipman at the Merchant Marine Academy. Tonight I'll be presenting my electromagnetic railgun as part of my King's Point Scholar program. And first I want to thank you all for allowing me to come here and present in front of you all. This is my first naming meeting. I, I really appreciate your time. So first I have a video for you that CBS covered regarding the Navy's two railguns that are being researched by General Economics as well as British Aerospace Engineering. It covers the projectiles of the guns, the guns themselves, and the lethality in the combat zone. The Navy has unveiled a new secret weapon that developers call it a rail gun. This new high-tech weapon is smaller, cheaper, and more destructive. As David Martin reports, it could dramatically change the way America fights wars. Fire. Propelled by an electromagnetic pulse, the projectile comes out of the barrel in a fireball of molten metal, traveling at seven times the speed of sound, as fast as going from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia in three minutes. The projectile sheds its steel cladding and destroys whatever it smashes into. In this case, a dummy warhead from an incoming missile. Seven times the speed of sound. You know, by the way, we can probably carry, oh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these on our ships. Just because they're so small. They're so small. Does this mean that gunpowder is a thing of the past? It may mean exactly that, David. According to Rear Admiral Matthew Plunder, Chief of Naval Research, the railgun is also dirt cheap compared to the multi-million dollar cost of today's missiles. That projectile costs about one one-hundredth of the cost of one of our traditional missiles. What does this cost? This costs right here about $25,000. There's an electronic guidance system inside so it can be fired at moving targets. This gun and the projectile round take care of any threat that flies in the sky. It could be a ballistic missile, it could be a cruise missile, it could be a threatening aircraft. Traveling at Mach 7, it can also pierce three walls of reinforced concrete. This is a lab gun, and it shoots a slug about this big. So think about that, a slug that big. A slug that big going Mach 7 puts a hole through six half-inch steel plates this big. Just this little slug. Went through all of these. All six of those. The railgun is scheduled to go to sea for the first time in 2016 aboard this cargo ship for further testing. It's still just a potential weapon, but one that could break the seemingly endless cycle of each new generation being more expensive than the last. For CBS This Morning, David Martin at the Naval Research Laboratory. So that was the Navy's two rail guns, and I performed my report on determining the exit velocity of a simple rail gun. Uh, I built two prototypes on laboratory and tested them. I was trying to examine the physics and mathematics of the guns, as well as their construction and operation, to determine that exit velocity using four sets of four sets of, uh, of theories: the energy theory, general theory, variable magnetic field theory, as well as the simplified theory. So. Question some of you may be asking, what is a railgun? I ask you all to provide me some assistance and take your right thumb and point it towards the ceiling. Someone, you don't have to do it at all. Right. So, uh, <laughs> your thumb is the current going through a conductor. If you wrap your fingers around in their natural direction, that's the magnetic field that's induced around the conductor by the current flow. The railgun works by having two conductors with opposing currents going through them. Their magnetic fields meet in the center and attempt to push those two, two conductors apart. <laughs> if you secure those two rails, all that magnetic repulsion has to go somewhere and is transferred in mechanical energy to the projectile itself. This is a picture of the General Atomics Blitzer Railgun. It's able to deliver a 10 pound projectile, 120 nautical miles, at 10 shots per minute at approximately Mach 7 or, or Mach 8. As I stated previously, it's 1 1 40th, uh, anywhere from 1 1 40th to 1 100th the cost of potential missile used for today's destroyers. So with an extremely powerful gun, we need a very powerful uh, power source. Available in the laboratory were conventional batteries, conventional capacitors, as well as a supercapacitor. Batteries offer a very slow discharge rate, but they're extremely energy dense. Special capacitors have a very high discharge rate, but have a very low energy density. And supercapacitors bridge that gap by having a very fast discharge rate and a very high energy density. However, they are much more expensive than either of the two options. Shown here is a picture of the sponge-like interior of a supercapacitor. 
And with a smaller volume that has an increased surface area, more the perforations, those eventual capacitors based on two plates facing each other. I performed some initial calculations to determine which power source would be best. The battery, the 12 volt, 7 ampere hour battery from KMAR had approximately 20 million joules per cubic foot. And a conventional capacitor, 120 volts, has approximately 300 joules per cubic foot, much less than the battery. And the supercapacitor has about 39,000 joules per cubic foot. So it's the intermediary, and again, the high discharge rate is, is what I was looking for. So after looking at what a railgun is, what sort of power source I should use, I, was, I looked at the entire circuit itself. I initially thought there would be an RLC circuit. The first diagram that I have drawn up here, RLC circuit, the resistance of the inductance of the rails, as well as the capacitance of the power source. And these are pure called voltage laws. This is a, using some differential manipulations for from equation 1 to equation 3. And doing some more research, I realized this, this isn't just an RLC circuit. This is an RLC circuit. It's an RC circuit. The inductance is very minimal in comparison to the resistance in the system. So I can model it just as an RC circuit, which would have this current pulse as shown here. A very high initial discharge, uh, very rapid um, delivery of energy to the victim. So I started looking at the various theories. The first was the, the most simplistic, the energy theory. The energy of the capacitor is one half CV squared, C being the capacitance and E being the voltage. The supercapacitor I ordered at 233 farads at 15 volts, which would offer an energy of 26,000 joules. If all that energy would be transferred to the projectile, uh, it would relate to approximately 2,600 meters per second with a 8 gram projectile. Extremely fast. Then I looked uh, more in depth into the general theory. This was a thesis provided by the Naval Postgraduate School. The first equation up here is the velocity of the projectile as it leaves the muzzle of the gun. Use the initial injection velocity. A lot of rail guns use compressed air or some sort of compressed gas to shoot the projectile into the rail as a prior to contact. And this gets over any static friction um, and also gets over the initial inertia of the projectile. The thesis looked at a trapezoidal pulse waveform and uh, uh, this equation was developed as the displacement of the projectile using the initial exit velocity and the velocity equation and the force felt on the projectile uh, by the energy going through the, the conductors. Now look at the variable magnetic field theory. This first equation, 6.0, is the acceleration equation that takes into account the lift of the projectile as well as the width of the individual conductors. From this, equation 6.1 is the velocity equation, and equation 6.4 is the time constant for the capacitor's discharge. One time constant is the resistance of the capacitor. Internal resistance was 4 micro ohms times the capacitance of 233 farads. And the capacitor to fully discharge would take 4.5 seconds. I then looked at the simplified theory, as the name uh, I mean, it says it's much simpler, simpler than the general theory, the variable magnetic field theory. The first equation up here is the Lorentz force equation, which is the force felt by each conductor from that magnetic repulsion. From the Lorentz force equation, I was able to find the acceleration in the projectile, which takes into account the width of the projectile, but does not add the width of the rails, the width of the conductors, as the variable magnetic field theory does. And within the simplified theory, there's three basic equations that I use for the calculations of my final rail gun. The time that the projectile is on the rails, T sub F, the velocity of the projectile as it reaches the muzzle of the gun, and KE, the kinetic energy of the projectile. So that was a lot of math. I appreciate you uh, listening to that portion. But what really matters here, the acceleration is the most important thing. The current going through the conductors is what imparts that acceleration as shown here, I squared. And that's the most important parameter. Reducing the resistance in the overall circuit and increasing the voltage is going to give you the maximum current possible, the maximum acceleration possible. Increasing the width of the projectile, uh, variable W, is also going to increase the acceleration, uh, as well as reducing the 
diameter of the resin cells. This is the way the projectile also agrees to be at that angle. So after all this analysis, I moved on to build my prototypes. This is my first prototype. It had two foot rails, a square cross-sectional area made out of aluminum. It was connected by approximately 20 feet of cable to the Kmart battery at 12 volts, 7 and meter hours, with a maximum potential current of 400 amps. Now, unfortunately, this gun did not fire, but I've learned a lot about the process of research from this, and I learned a lot from my second rail gun and what I did in the group call. However, the battery was insufficient for a fast discharge rate, and then anything from a positive, positive terminal of the power source to the negative terminal of the power source is the rail gun. At 20 feet of cabling is the rail gun, but it's not a system projectile at all at its acceleration. This is a diagram of the electrical circuit for my first prototype. These are the two rails with the projectile in between here from the the circuit. This is the power source of the battery with its 30 micro ohm internal resistance. I use a fire stir in line with the positive terminal battery to, again, what I thought were the rails to trigger the firing sequence. I used a 5 volt DC generator in line with the push button so I could stand 20 feet away in a safe location and shoot it off. As I said previously, unfortunately, it did not shoot. It did weld itself, which was, which was quite interesting to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, my next challenge was how do I determine the exit velocity of the gun? One thought I had was using a weight suspended from the ceiling, and after the projectile strikes that weight, seeing the angle of inclination, using that to determine the, the velocity of the multiple gun. And I was thinking through the lab and found some photo dates and figured that that would be a much simpler solution. Place them one foot apart and seeing the time it took for them to travel that one foot, and only feet per second. This is a picture of Dr. Talleran working on the final rail gun. It's 82 long. I used a 2x4 as a supporting structure and screwed down an angle line on top of that for a 6.35 millimeter gap between the rails. It's a 7 millimeter diameter soft carbon steel ball as a projectile. After building my first prototype and evaluating that, I then did some more calculations for my final rail gun to determine the exit velocity. With the 4 micro ohm internal resistance set at 15 volts, the maximum current that the capacitor could possibly deliver to the projectile was 3,750 amps. This again is a perfect situation ignoring the resistance of the projectile and ignoring the resistance of the, of the rails. It would take 3.5 seconds for the projectile to reach the end of the rails, 2.4 meters or 8 feet, without having the majority of the energy from the capacitor discharge projectile. It's going to took five time passes of 4.5 seconds for the capacitor to discharge. So I was looking at 163 meters per second or 534 feet per second in an ideal situation. As I was building the gun, like I said previously, I used a 2x4 with two pieces of angle line screwed down on the other side. About every three inches, I put a, I put a screw in just to cap it out the red force in case the rails were to blow out during the fire. The second issue I came across was how do I strap the gun to, as you can see here, the, the rolling tables. I was using uh, cinch straps, graciously provided by my father. Uh, to hold the gun down on the tables. I made a sled to go underneath the gun so I could I could hold it down uh, without any movement, without obstructing the uh, obstructing the movement of the projectile. In the back here it's a little hard to see, but I have the, the super capacitor set up back there. Then I test fired the gun. Again I had an unsuccessful firing. But still I learned a lot from this process. I had some issues with the materials. The 2x4 that I used for the supporting structure was slightly warped, as were the rails themselves. There was a, a lot of middle scale that came on the angle iron when I uh, first purchased it. I did have a difficult time of trying to remove that from the, from the system, which increased the resistance overall. So after performing some checks with the hole meter, with the hole meter to determine the resistance to the circuit, about half an ohm, the maximum current I was looking at was up to actually 200 amps. It was not enough to propel projectile down the rails. Were I to do this again, or improve upon my, 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 my prototype, I would more like to use a thermoplastic casing that I could mold perfectly uh, to what I was desiring, have it as flush as possible, eliminating the distortions from the 2x4. I'd use 
square cross-sectional layer of rails can add a copper, and a projectile that made it flush into the rails can decrease the resistance and increase the conductivity. We used power source with a much higher voltage. I was working at 15 volts. I was working at that low voltage for safety reasons, um, but I would really uh, prefer to use 500 volts or 1,000 volts. I would be thanks to conventional capacitors uh, having a series of parallel formations that could increase the voltage and increase the energy stored. And have an initial velocity to compress gas or some sort of compressed air to projectile.